Let's be honest, the high-speed rail situation in the US right now is pretty bleak, but this channel is all about keeping it positive. So today it's an optimistic look at the future of the Northeast Corridor and what it might look like to extend a cell service all the way down to Atlanta. It's coming up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation, viewer suggested topics always appreciated, and everything this channel has done on high speed rail to this point has been around travel demand between city pairs. I do recognize city pairs are just one piece of the puzzle though, and I've definitely had viewer suggestions to dig deeper. And I mean a lot of them, but a good example is this one from viewer Andrew Diamond on my stations video. I'm not gonna read it verbatim, but his point is that on certain corridors like DC to Atlanta, any single city pair may not be that strong, but the accumulation of combined demand from overlapping city pairs may create a situation where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So today I'm not going to focus on city pairs directly, although they will be at the core of all the calculations I'm going to do. Instead, I'm going to focus on corridors and segments and show how layering the origin destination or OD demand for multiple city pairs onto a single segment generates a segment score and gives us a new way to talk about the relative importance of different corridors. All the analysis I'm going to do here is going to be based around the gravity model and the triangle graph I always use for this kind of thing. I do get a lot of questions about how the calculation works, so I'm going to spend a little time on it once we start looking at the first segment I want to focus on. Also, a couple updates to assumptions that are changes from previous videos I've made on this topic. For cities, I'm using metropolitan statistical areas with the newish 2021 population estimates from the Census Bureau. Also, previously I've only looked at metro areas of a million plus, but I'm including 500k and up in this analysis with the idea that these are the cities a high-speed rail service would actually stop at. So when we talk about the Acela Corridor, for example, I'm not looking at New York and Newark separately since they're in the same MSA, and I'm also not looking at Trenton since it's under 500,000. For distance between cities, I'm using the average between the driving distance and the distance as the crow flies. I just think this is a good approximation of what true high-speed rail distance would look like, since it splits the difference between avoiding the worst topography, but also having gentler curves and more direct alignments. Finally, for what we're talking about today, I'm assuming actual high-speed rail, with speeds in the 180 mile per hour plus range and not whatever Amtrak is running right now. Okay, let's get into our first segment and build out from there. And let's just dive into the heart of this whole thing, which is the segment from New York Penn Station to Philadelphia 30th Street. There's gonna be a lot happening here, but let's start with the obvious, which is demand specifically between these two cities. So there are two steps. One is coming up with an overall travel demand, regardless of which mode people are using. This is basically a function of how big the two cities are and how close together they are. It's why they call it gravity, right? The cities exert a force on each other because of their proximity and their mass, so to speak. There are more complicated versions of the gravity calculation you can do, but at its most basic, it's the product of the two masses divided by the distance between them squared. So just for the demand between New York and Philadelphia, we can do a gravity calculation. We multiply the two populations together, which creates an extremely unwieldy number. So just to make it easier to look at, I'm going to move the decimal place on all of these by dividing by 100 million, or you could say multiplying by 10 to the negative eighth. For New York to Philly, that's a gravity score of 152.1. This is the heaviest pair in the corridor, just in terms of pure travel demand, regardless of mode. It's probably the heaviest pair in the US, although I'd have to double check like LA and Inland Empire. So now we've got a number that represents all travel demand, regardless of whether it's highway, air, or rail. So now we need a number that will tell us how much of that gravity score might apply specifically to high-speed rail. Now I've shown this graph repeatedly in my high-speed rail videos, but it's worth revisiting. The graph reflects very generalized assumptions about travel times by highway, by air, and by high-speed rail over distances up to 600 miles or so. Highway travel is the slowest, of course, but there's no access or egress time and no waiting time. You get in your car and go. 
Air travel is the fastest, but you have to account for access and egress on each end of the trip, security, boarding, and takeoff and landing process. So there's a big fixed time cost, but then high-speed rail kind of splits the difference here. It's a lot faster than a car, a lot slower than a plane. There's some access and egress time, but it's gonna be more centrally located than an airport, and you're not gonna have nearly the dead time waiting. So the car is gonna be more advantageous at shorter distances. A plane is gonna be better for longer distances, but high-speed rail is gonna be the superior option for a lot of trips between, say, 75 and 600 miles, with the maximum advantage coming at around 250 miles. Now I'm gonna basically apply this graph or the numbers behind it to my gravity score. In modeling speak, you could say that step one, the gravity score is trip generation and what we're doing now is mode choice. I'm gonna give full credit or 1.0 for a distance of 250 miles. And then that credit is gonna decay as distance increases or decreases to where I'm gonna give zero credit at 75 and 600 miles. This is just linear, I'm not overcomplicating this. And this is worth emphasizing. I'm giving a factor of one at 250 miles and zero at 75 and 600, but that doesn't mean I'm assuming everyone will take high-speed rail at 250 miles and no one will at the other two distances. It's just a factor for estimating the relative potential of the city pair. In practice, there are some people who will look at a 250 mile trip and just still not take rail on principle because they think it's like a socialist boondoggle or a George Soros plot. And there are some people, probably a lot of this channel's viewers, who will be below 75 miles or above 600 and they'll still take rail because eh, it's more sustainable or more comfortable or eh, they're just trained nerds. All I'm saying here is, those two tendencies tend to cancel out. Keep in mind, this is all theoretical. It's a model for estimation. Actual humans behave in all sorts of unpredictable ways. And all we're trying to get to here is some measure of aggregate travel activity. So for New York to Philly, I've got the high speed rail distance as 90 miles, which gives me a distance factor of 0.09. We multiply that factor by the gravity score and we get what I'm calling the ridership potential index or RPI, which for this pair comes out to 13.0. One more thing I think it's important to point out, whether 250 miles is a quote unquote optimal distance really depends on how you're thinking about it. From the perspective of an individual traveler, 250 miles gives the greatest travel time benefit. But from a ridership perspective, the optimal is gonna be something more like 150 miles. This is because of the exponential nature of the gravity model as the distance shrinks. At 150 miles, you get a lower distance factor than you would at 250, but all you're doing is taking a smaller share of a much larger number. Here's how the numbers would play out for Philadelphia and New York at different distances. So I'm not saying this is the quote unquote right way to do this. I keep this very simplified on purpose, just so it's transparent and easy to digest and so you can replicate it on your own time if you want. In an actual professional ridership analysis, you'd use a much more detailed model with more geographic granularity. An example is the NEC future study. I'll leave a link to this in the description, but for the independent variables, besides population, which is the obvious one, this particular model used employment, per capita income, and LOS, which I believe is a proxy for baseline travel conditions between a city pair. This is good work, I'm sure, but it's too black boxy for what I'm doing here. What I'm giving you isn't gonna be quite as robust, but you'll see that the ridership potential index results I come up with for the Acela city pairs map pretty closely to the ridership data from the Acela route. So we've got the New York to Philly RPI, which we can now assign to the New York to Philly segment. And now we have to add everything else that's happening on this segment, which is the RPI for New York to Washington, which is the highest city pair RPI on the corridor, and the RPI for New York to Baltimore, which is no slouch. And then we have to layer on the pairings that Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington make with every other city north of New York. Remember, for this, we're assuming true high-speed rail in the form put forward in the 2016 final EIS and by the North Atlantic Rail Alliance, which puts the preferred alignment through Hartford and New Haven, then across Long Island Sound. As we layer these on, a lot of them barely make a blip, 
just because of size or distance. But Boston to Philly is significant. And finally, we can zoom out from the New York to Philly segment and fill in the rest of the segments the same way. This gives us a sense of the relative importance of each segment on the corridor, which is really important when you're thinking about prioritizing investments. A couple final clarifications before we move on to seeing what happens when we extend the alignment south. First of all, the whole approach I'm showing you implies that demand between cities is a static number that gets divided up among modes differently depending on the distance. In reality, if you add better service, a higher speed rail line, obviously, but even increased rail or air frequencies, it will induce additional travel. Just like in my induced demand video, if you lower the time cost of travel, you release just a bit more latent demand. Also, when I show these cities on an alignment map, this isn't meant to imply which stations would or wouldn't be included. On a future alignment, I'd still expect stops in Newark and Wilmington, for example, even though they are both considered parts of larger MSAs. Okay, before we get to what at least I think is the fun part, which is what happens when we start adding cities going south, quick reminder to drop a like on the video if you're enjoying, subscribe if you haven't already. Comments down below are great, although to be honest, I usually only respond in the first 24 or 48 hours of the video release. I am fun on social media purportedly, and of course there's a link to my Patreon down in the description if you're looking for other ways to support the channel and maybe see some bonus content. Sub count check. I do have enough subscribers to fill a few new MLV parks, but I can't let this number go by without going to Spain. This is Estadio Ramon Sanchez Pijuan, home of Sevilla Football Club in Spain's top flight, and this has to be a candidate for my most urbanist stadium, World Edition. Let me know if you actually want me to do that topic. Almost no surface parking. It's nestled into a dense neighborhood with tons of bars and restaurants. There's a metro station right out front and it has two-way protected bike lanes running both north-south and east-west. I just don't know if you can do it better than this. Okay, we're gonna start extending this line to the south, but let me know if this whole exercise is floating your boat. And if you'd like to see me do something similar for like California or Texas or the Midwest. Remember, we're limiting the scope to metro areas over 500K, so our next stop is Richmond. So we calculate the RPIs for all the new OD pairs Richmond makes with the cities to the north. Because the corridor isn't 600 miles yet, Richmond has at least a small RPI with every other city, even a smaller one like New Haven. The New York pair is the most significant just because of the sheer gravity of New York, but Philadelphia and Washington are solid too. So we have a new segment with its own RPI, which is DC to Richmond, and we've increased the RPIs of every other segment on the corridor, at least a little. Now we repeat the process for every subsequent metro area, over 500,000 as we move down the extended corridor. I made an executive decision to loop down to Raleigh before coming back up to Durham, just to honor the fact that they are two separate metro areas. In reality, you might save infrastructure by hitting Durham only or splitting the distance the way Raleigh-Durham Airport does. That next stop in Raleigh extends our corridor to over 600 miles, so we start getting RPIs of zero for pairings with cities like Boston. As we extend to the south, we layer on all the potential pairings with Durham, Greensboro, Winston-Salem, Charlotte, Greenville, South Carolina, and finally Atlanta. The biggest new city pair on this whole thing is Charlotte to Atlanta, and it isn't really close. They're the two largest cities on the new southern alignment, and I'm assuming a rail distance of 245 miles, which is going to make it pretty dominant over highway and air. So now we've added everything so we can zoom out and look at how the RPI varies from segment to segment on the corridor. New York to Philadelphia is still the highest potential segment with Philadelphia to Baltimore a not too distant second. The numbers south of DC are quite a bit lower. It's not unexpected and it's not a reason not to build high speed rail to the south. Just something to think about as we prioritize investments. The weakest segment is Winston-Salem to Charlotte, which comes out at 3.3. My original idea for this video was actually to continue on by adding branches and potential interlines to Montreal and Toronto and Chicago and showing how that all played out. But then I'd have to talk about interlining and 
transfer penalties and you know, this video is already getting too long. If you want to see that or similar analysis for any other corridors, let me know down in the comments. Okay, I'm going to cut it there today. This was super fun to analyze, so I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching and special thanks as usual to the patrons who keep making me decrease the font size and the credits every week. I'll be back with a new topic to explore next week and I'll see you then.